Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very special guest coming right up who's none other than Brandon Webb. And he's here today to share with us his new book, Mastering Fear, A Navy SEAL's Guide. Now, Brandon is a former U.S. Navy SEAL sniper. He's a New York Times bestselling author, experimental aircraft pilot, and entrepreneur. He's the founder of the Hurricane Group, which is a U.S.-based media and e-commerce company focused on outdoors and the military. Brandon also has been featured regularly on international media and national media as a military and special ops subject matter expert. He has contributed to ABC, Good Morning America, NBC, The Today Show, Fox News, CNN, the BBC, Cyrus XM, MSNBC, and the New York Times, just to name a few. So let's welcome to the show, Brandon Webb. Thanks for having me. What a pleasure it is to have you here, Brandon. And gosh, we get to spend time talking about this book, which I love, Mastering Fear. My goodness, I've learned so much from this book. Yeah, the you know, the book was inspired by this randomly I taught my best friend how to swim and through that process helped him overcome his fear of the water and he was the one that encouraged me to write the book. He said, You you need to write a book about this because uh, and, and my friend is no slouch, like Kamal Ravikant is a best selling author, venture capitalist. Um, you know, was a, one of the original people at WebMD uh, back in Silicon Valley, boom, and, and uh, today writes one of the largest cryptocurrency newsletters. So he had gone most of his adult life just being afraid of the water. And he said the one thing you were able to do that other people that tried me to sw- teach me to swim would just go right into teaching me the strokes, but they didn't really address this fear. Uh, and that's what I ended up doing, and and I like the idea. I I, I pitched it to my call, my uh, my agent Alyssa and then uh, my editor Bria at Penguin, and she's like, "Hey, it sounds like a great book." So uh, I'm really happy with it. Well, you know, I have learned so much from this book, and what I have really appreciated, I mean, you're this big, tough Navy SEAL guy, you know, so it, the principles in this book aren't just for big, tough guys. I mean, they're for everybody. Yeah, 100%. I, the one thing I wanted to to address was that this whole misconception that you know, Navy SEALs don't have any fear and which is just not the case. It's just we're really good at overcoming or mastering our fear. And so I wanted to tell some some of my own personal stories of fear. And, it, you know, it didn't always start in the SEAL teams. I I remember I, I told the story about getting the sharks out of your head. I, I got my first job on a scuba diving boat taking recreational divers. Um, off the coast of California in the Channel Islands to dive all these amazing spots. And I grew up working on this boat as a 12 year old kid. The captain taught me how to dive, uh, the first summer I worked on the boat. But I remember towards the end of summer, um, we were at one of the northern islands called San Miguel. And there was a big, uh, the diving was great, but there was a big uh, sea lion habitat on the back side of the island. And we were diving in the day, and, and if everyone, anyone of your listeners has seen the Shark Week on Discovery Channel, they know what eats sea lions. It's a great white shark. Um, For and, sure. And every yeah, every time we go out to San Miguel Island, we'd see great whites, usually on the surface. And so I was just this young kid, learned how to dive, and was just terrified of sharks. And, and I remember. Uh, you know, we had fed the the passengers for the night. You know, we everyone was kind of bedded down, and and I went to bed with the crew up in the up in the main cabin. We call it the wheelhouse where you drive the boat. Uh, we had bunks there for the captain and crew, and I, I was dead asleep. And the ca- captain Mike woke me up around two in the morning, and I could 
I could hear the engine was running, the winch was running because they were trying to pull the anchor to move to calmer water. And Captain Mike says, Hey, he shined the light in my eyes. Like, get, get up. You got to get your wetsuit on and dive on the anchor and, and get it unstuck. And I, and I had done that plenty of time in the daytime. And I remember going, that's crazy. Like thinking to myself, like there's sharks down there. It's nighttime. It's, it's the weather is rough. The bottom is going to be stirred up. Like I, I knew all this stuff, but it was, it was just like, I was making this scene even worse in my head. But I, you know, I said, okay, I just got to take it one step at a time. And I went, got my wetsuit on. I got my tank on, walked to the bow. They swung the gate open and I, I jumped in with my dive light and I swam as fast as I could down to the bottom about 50 feet down. And, and I could see the sea lions whizzing past me because of the, they had the bioluminescence. You know, so they were yeah. like lighting up in the water. And I, I remember thinking, okay, well, at least, at least they're here. And that's a good sign because when the sea lions are gone, there's, that means there's a sh- big shark around. Mm. So I got the, you know, long story longer. I ended up swimming down. I saw the chain wrapped around this big kind of truck size ledge. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then swam the chain around, got it unstuck, came up and, and realized it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> and I, I think that's a good example. Like people generally, they have these fears and they, they make up this crazy story in their head and it just gets worse and worse. And, and in reality, it's really not that as bad as they think um and and, but that was like one of the first times i could remember when i was really scared and and had to overcome that fear because i didn't want to let these guys down uh and and i could tell they're kind of testing me also um but you know i wanted to to tell real stories and and mastering fear and and also feature you know friends of mine like james altucher very successful guy had a huge fear of public speaking and decided to overcome that by taking stand-up comedy lessons in New York. Um, now, five years later, he's a pretty damn good comic. Um, but I, and I can't imagine that. You know, It's bad <laughs> enough. I, I enjoy public speaking, but I don't know if I would enjoy getting up at a New York comedy club in front of that crowd and taking the abuse. <laughs> I can't think of a worse public speaking environment. Yeah, that's and especially in New York. I mean, that could be a little brutal, you know. That'd be like in New York, yeah. LA. Yeah, you know, it could be a, a yeah. tough crowd doing that. <laughs> so. Yeah, hundred hundred percent. Oh my goodness! But yeah, you know, everyone has fear, and I would say the other thing that I learned about writing a book was I I had to develop this system, so I started thinking about just the ways that people that I knew that I'd interviewed uh, guys like astronaut Scott Kelly uh, for my, for my own podcast and, and just started thinking about what are the fundamentals that people apply to, to fear, to overcome. And, and it kind of built a system in mastering fear so people can, can basically identify it and, you know, deal with the fear, whether it's a big or small fear uh, and then you, you know, the idea is you, it becomes a habit after, after time. Uh, and then, you know, I, I, as a result of that, I'll share another story. Um, I taught my daughter how to fly, to, to fly my plane in a aileron roll. So it's like a barrel roll. She, and, and she was 12 years old and, you know, she was scared at first and I kind of like, you know, told, walk her through it. She'd been flying with me enough times, and then finally she she did it on her own. Um, and she was like, wow, that's amazing, Dad. And then later that year, she was graduating eighth grade and volunteered to MC the kind of end-of-year events with parents and kids. So they had these recitals and all this stuff. And she was the main MC of this entire school. Um, like introducing the acts and, you know, it's like, like, like the host of the Emmys, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Only it's the eighth grade school, <laughs> but still, I, I mean, I looked at her, I was like, Olivia, that's amazing. Like, I can't believe, you know, you have the guts to do this. I, I said, you're, I didn't have the guts to do that when I was your age. And she's like, 
I can fly a plane upside down. I can do this. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's, you know, that's the kind of importance, even as parents, encouraging our kids to kind of take risks and because it, it develops confidence and, and a habit of overcoming their, their fears. You know, when you, when you help them through that stuff early on in life, I think you're setting the, the kids up for success. So I think this book is really great for parents. Oh, I can, you know, it's so fun to see your Instagram account with all the different pictures of flying. And I've seen pictures of your daughter and, and, you know, definitely when you guys are upside down viewing New York, <laughs> I mean, how great is that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, once she does that, that, she could do anything, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, I remember the first time I took her around the Statue of Liberty, she was oh, maybe 11 and I'm, we're, we're doing a circle at a thousand feet over the statue and she's like, Hey dad, can you bank the plane a little harder? And then I look over and then she's taking that selfie that I posted on my Instagram of her. She's just basically trying to get a good selfie of her, the plane and the statue of Liberty. <laughs> lined up. And then now all my friends want the same picture. They're like, I want the photo that your daughter has. You might have to green screen that one, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a yeah. A lot of people would be you know, kind of doing that with, but, you know, but it says a lot though. So when we look at the principles in mastering fear, how they're relatable to children, to teens, to people in business, I mean, there's not a segment of the population that this book doesn't apply to. Yeah, it, it applies to everybody, um, really. I mean, I think the only people that don't tell you they're, they don't fear anything or they're lying to you or they're insane. Mm -hmm. um, I, one of the things that I really talk about is rehearsal. It's in chapter two. I get into to the rehearsal and that, that comes from my experience working with a, a guy named Lanny Basham, who when I was a Navy SEAL sniper instructor and then ended up taking over the course as course manager um, we were working with uh, a consultant, Lanny Basham, who's an Olympic gold medalist. And, and Lanny, um, Lanny was a pioneer in, in mental management. And, and what we know today really is positive psychology. He had went to the Olympics in the early 70s, I think 72. He went to Germany. He was a world champion uh, a rifle shooter. He was in the Army Marksmanship wow. Unit, was a, was a world champion. Went to the Olympics. Everybody expected him to to win gold, and he was on the bus to go to the final match. And he said these Russian guys were were kind of chatting him up and getting in his head, and he he completely he completely just crumbled. He said, yeah, "I shot the worst tournament of my life." He, he still ended up winning silver. So he comes back from that, and he he says. Wow, how, how how do I deal with this? Like, what happened? And so he went to all these sports psychologists, and they just wanted to make him better and, and okay with being number two. And he's like, no, that's not what I want. So he decided to go uh, survey all the Olympic gold medalists that he could get in touch with, and he was on the Olympic team. So he said, fortunately, they would return his call. So he he spent a year categorizing the mindset of a champion and then developed this program for himself, went back to the Olympics four years later in Montreal. Um, and, and he, at this time he wasn't in, he was still in the army, but they transferred him. So he, he wasn't in a position where he, he was in the special unit before and had all this time to practice. He had, he practiced for the second Olympics in his basement at 5 a.m. every morning, dry firing, so we're dry firing basically with no no rounds in the gun and visualizing, visualizing his matches and then ended up winning the gold medal, um, which he he told me before he won the gold, he said it was torture. He said, if you, when you're a silver medalist, it's, he says, people, the first thing they ask you is who won gold. <laughs> he oh, said, it's no. just terrible. <laughs> That's um, awful. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but 
the power of visualization is is incredible. Like you can imagine yourself doing something that you're afraid of and do it over and over again. And it helps you overcome the fear. And I did that with Kamal when I, I, in one week, I took him from being completely terrified, you know, going in, going into the pool on the ladder, gripping the ladder, letting go and like grasping for the side on Monday. And on, on Friday, he would come in the pool, do a cannonball, sink to the bottom, hold his breath for half a minute and then come up and, and swim laps. It, like it was a totally different Kamal. And, and part of that was I gave him homework. I said, you have to go home every before you go to bed and just imagine yourself the hour that we did here, just imagine yourself doing it over again. Uh, Cause it will help. Um, so the visualization stuff is, is huge. And that's kind of what I encourage people to do. If, if they really, you know, are, are stuck. Um, but anyway, I, I, it's my favorite book I've written so far. <laughs> Cause I think it's going to help so many people. <laughs> Well, it, it most definitely is. I mean, there's so many points to it that I found helpful in my own personal journey. You know, and um, you know, it, it kind of has me wondering when people reach out to you, what do you think is like the number one thing that keeps them, you know, from being able to master their fear? Is it that talk that they have in their head? You know, is it they're not visualizing well enough? What do you think it is? Um, I think some of I think sometimes people get hung up um, and, and they don't, and I talk about this in chapter five and I almost, I, I toyed with it, the, the whole knowing what matters, right? Cause when you really, when you really get to the, to the point of what matters, whether it's relationships, career, or, or your goals, like vision for the future, like that really kind of anchors you in a certain direction and i see a lot of people that don't they don't put the time into into that as they they should and and you probably have also seen or run into people that are in careers so like i know a doctor in new york that spent all this money and time on a on a career in medicine his first year really as a true doctor he's like i I can't stand this. Like I just, I did it because my parents wanted me to do it. And so, um, you know, you, so I think that's, ex, that's extremely important. The other thing is I, I think people to my original story of getting the sharks out of your head, they imagine this scenario that is just way worse than it, than it is in reality. Right. And that, that's maybe it's a career change. Um, and you know, people are afraid to, to kind of take the leap, but they're not, you know, and, and again, like when you, when you realize how short life is and, and it's, it's extremely short. I, I did an exercise where I put the day, like I imagined I lived to a hundred and I put the days on the back of a one door and didn't even take up the whole door. <laughs> that kind of just, it's a wake, wake up call. Um, yeah. But, you know, when you realize that you don't have that much time on this planet and you might as well just, I forget what movie quote it was, but the whole get busy living. Um, mm-hmm. It was like a, a Shawshank Redemption or something, but um, yeah, they're just stuck in their own head. It's, it's as simple as that. I mean, that's the long answer to your question. I know another guy um, in my my friend group who is an, one of the most talented musicians, like can sing, can play multiple instruments, almost had, like could have had a, a career in music, but went into the family business and he is miserable and he just won't. He's just like sitting in this cage with the door open and won't won't let him, won't walk out. And it just blows me away. Um, Yeah, it's interesting, the different fears that hold people back, 
you know, you know, speaking in public's a big one for people that are in business. I've seen a lot of people um, that are in sales and do cold calling. Man, that's a huge fear going and talking to people yeah. you don't know. You know, so I mean, your book Mastering Fear helps people through every stage of that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, you know, it's I'm trying to think of a another good story, like a career story. I remember um, Betsy Morgan, who was, was, I think, the first professional CEO at Huffington Post. Um, she's on my on my board of directors, my company now. But she told me the story about the time when she was at CBS as an executive and could kind of tell that media, the landscape was shifting. And, and I mean, it's very intuitive of her back, back then. Um, Cause this was over a decade ago. She saw the kind of writing on the wall and she, she agreed to take the position and, and told her boss who was Les Moonves that, you know, I'm, I'm leaving CBS and he's like, Hey, you're, you're like a star, rising star here. What are you doing? Like, no, how could you go to this po- place called the Huffington Post? And he said, quote, who the hell is ever going to read the news on the internet? <laughs> 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 um, but she, you know, she made that jump. And, and you know, she's, she's got a husband and a daughter, and I, I just have a lot of, a lot of respect um, for her. And again, like, not without fear, right? Like she, she said it wasn't, it wasn't a move without fear, but she's like, I got to do this. Um, even, uh, I tell the story of Scott Kelly, the astronaut. He was afraid to apply for the astronaut program. He didn't think he was good enough. Oh my God. And it took him like, it took him a couple months to kind of work up the guts. And he said, well, if I don't fill out the damn application, for sure, I'm never going to get in. Um, and then he ended up getting accepted and I think now still has the record for the longest time and space for an American. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I try and feature these real, the system, but also tell these stories of, of successful people from a, a variety of different backgrounds. Um, another story was uh, CJ Ramon. He's the bass player of the Ramones. He was actually a, a, a Marine. He was a veteran. Um, his last couple of weeks in the Marines, he spent trying, like practicing to try out to replace the, the uh, bass player who had left the, the Ramones and they were running an audition. And he ended up getting the job. And he took the, he was terrified the first time he said he went on, he was supposed to go on stage because they loved this. I forget the guy's name, but the, the old bass player. You know, and there was just people screaming at him, obscenity. <laughs> it's like it was, yeah, not a <laughs> not a pleasant thing. But he's like, you know what? I and he even talked about visual visualizing, kind of like imagining himself uh, in advance. But he went out there and just just embraced it. And he said when he embraced kind of that that environment, they just turned, and they saw it. Like he was just like bring it on. It's like the audience completely changed <laughs> and like just like instantly changed. So just, uh, and, you know, and I think people can sense that fear too sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Probably a mile away. Well, and so yeah. with the visualization part, do you still use that in your daily business today? Yeah, I, I use visualization. The other thing, I talk about, I think one of the most important things is to have a, a vision statement. Um, it's it basically, you know, you call it a mantra or whatever, but it's, it's a, it's kind of a, a statement that you write that you can look at every day. And I, I open it up and, and look at it every morning. And then sometimes when I'm off center, I go back and read it. It's all it is is a positive reinforcement. Uh, mm-hmm. I will. I'll actually pull mine up right now and share it with you guys. Yeah, because you know everyone wants to know that, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't mind sharing it. So let's see. Okay, so here's my kind of – yeah. So I have a 
a more detailed vision statement, but this is my daily mantra, the, the one I look at every day. And, and, and if I'm, I get off center because we, you know, we're all human. We're all prone to, to having emotional reactions. Um, I go back to this and kind of look at it and, and it, it re- helps reset me. Um, so it's, here it goes. So it's, um, I am building a billion dollar company. I'm always learning and improving. I smile a lot. I love my kids, friends, and family. They love me. Um, I'm a New York Times bestselling author. I always look for the best in people. I treat others like I want to be treated. I anticipate instead of react. I wish happiness and express gratitude because it brings happiness in return. I know that innovation leaders rule the world. Um, I'm a successful entrepreneur and have the knowledge to start any business I want and be successful. That's my, that's my kind of daily. Well, you can check all those boxes off answer. because you have that, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. so, <laughs> you, know you're, you are a living example of your mission statement. And, and that's kind of what we want to end up being is a living example of our mission statements, you know? Yeah. It's, it's just helpful to have that as a reminder. And, and also I talk about it in the book as a tool. Like if you, let's say you have this issue with public speaking mm-hmm. and, and you can put on your, you know, a yellow sticky or put it on your phone, your notes on your phone. And it's this thing that reminds you every day. Like I am, uh, you know, and you don't have to like, lie to yourself, right? Like you don't have to put, I'm a great public speaker, but I would start off with, if, if you're, you have this fear of public speaking and you've made a decision and, and a commitment to do something about it. Um, for one, you have to make a, make a plan and a commitment, you know, of what to do, whether it's take a class or like a join a Toastmasters and something like that, um, which, which are great, great groups to, to kind of practice the speaking um, but, but put in your, put in your kind of daily statement that I am, I, I'm committed to learning and becoming a good public speaker. Like that's a great place to start. And then you could kind of change it over time. And then it, you know, maybe it, it eventually you get to that. I'm a, I'm a well practiced public speaker. Um, and public speaking is like, it's got to be one of the top 10 fears. Mm-hmm. Um, Right it there with the diving with sharks, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and I was afraid to, afraid too. Like I went, I went to Navy instructor school, and they make you get up in front of the class and practice over and over, and and they videotape you, and eventually you, you just realize that you're always gonna. I, I don't know anyone that speaks professionally that isn't a little bit nervous or have those little butterflies before they go up on stage. It just happens to everybody. And when you do it enough, you know that that's just part of the game and it goes away. It's like, as you kind of get into your speech, it eventually just goes away and you, you just realize that now I like it because it, it kind of is that nervous energy forces me. Uh, I use it as a tool to force me to, to give, make sure I'm giving my best effort. And what a great way to use that, though, you know, to use that nervous energy to kind of propel you forward instead of keeping you back. Yeah, I would. I'll share one story about visualization that uh, my friend Lanny shared with me way back when he was uh, consulting with us try, when we were trying to make a better sniper program in the Navy SEALs. Uh, Lanny. Um, knew this guy. Um, I think it was Captain Jack Sands. He was a prisoner of war, and he had spent you know, four years in a prisoner of war camp in Vietnam. He was a pilot that was shot down, and he, when the war ended, they flew him and a bunch of prisoners back to San Diego, uh, and were taking it. They landed at North Island, and they were put in an ambulance to take to Balboa Naval Hospital for evaluation. This guy dealt with being in the prison camp all these years by by playing golf in his head. It was just kind of his way to deal with the the confinement and 
And I, look, I spent four days in a, in a simulated prison camp and it, it is no joke. And by the fourth day, you're, you're pretty much, you know, convinced you're, you're in a real camp. <laughs> I lived in a concrete box for, and went to the bathroom in a soldier's coffee can for four days. And I still remember I was war criminal five three. That was my name, my new name. But, but I can't imagine doing that for four years. Like you've got to really be incredibly mentally tough. Um, so this guy, four years later, he gets out. He drives in the ambulance. He sees that they're driving out the back gate past the golf course at North Island. And he's just like, look, stop, stop the vehicle. I got to get out and play golf. Like this is, I just have to shoot around a golf. And they looked at me like he was crazy. So he gets out and he goes in the clubhouse and he looks like hell. Like he hasn't, he's like six foot tall, you know, malnourished, you know, extremely skin and bones looking. And, and they look at him like they're, this guy's in the wrong place. Like some homeless guy walked in off the street. They're, they're like wanting to throw him out. And then he said, he told them who he was. And then they just kind of teared up and took him to the, to the pro shop, kind of decked him out with the, you know, new, shoes and got him like and he says guys i just want to play i want to play nine holes and um they take him out there and he shoots he shoots nine holes par having not practiced like he hadn't picked up a club in over four years (laughs) and they were blown away and they asked him like how is this possible and he says i've been playing perfect golf in my head for four years i haven't hit a bad shot in four years (laughs) So it just shows, you know, the power of, of visualization and, and and practicing in a you know perfect positive place. And 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 this is, you know, no stranger to the modern, you know, champions like the even Michael Phelps when he won the one of his gold medals in Beijing. It was he was in a final swim match and his. He jumped in and his goggles flooded, but he had already rehearsed that contingency. So you can also use, you can use this, you know, as a way to, to deal with adversity, kind of rehearse it in your head on, on how you would deal with it. Um, and, and so he knew that he would just start counting his stroke and he won that race and set a world record and won another gold medal with flooded goggles because he's, he used visualization as a tool. And so it's just an incredibly powerful thing. Uh, And especially to teach to kids. Yeah. I mean, because could you imagine just all the different fears children can overcome by just doing that, by playing that kind of mind game, you know? Yeah. And, you know, as a dad to see my, my kids grow up to be really confident, and because I've, you know, I've let them take risks and encourage them and sometimes nudge, nudge them to take risks. And, you know, me as an eighth grader giving a, being up in front of parents and students and seeing that end of year school event, not a chance. <laughs> so, but I, I, you know, I'm so, so proud of, of my daughter, Olivia, for doing that. Well, you're obviously a very good parent because, I know all parents want to have their children be better than them. And, you know, she's she's got a great head start with uh, mastering fear and being able to kind of just go and do these very courageous things in her young life already. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's, she actually coached my, my young youngest son, Grayson. He's obsessed with soccer and sports. And we were at an airport, and he saw one of his favorite soccer teams. And they were were in the food court area, and he was like, "Oh my god!" And like, I, he saw the player, you know, and he's like, "That's that's you know so and so," and I really want to go talk to him and take a photo. And and he's like, "Come, can you come with me, Dad?" And I was like, "Look, you gotta ask yourself." And and then his sister kind of took over, and she's like, "You can do it, buddy." You know, you, you gotta do it yourself though. This, like these chances don't come around very often. And he was just like hands in the pockets and, and then he eventually worked up the guts to do, to go over there. 
because I told him, I was like, I, if I do this for you, I'm not doing you other, any favors in life. So you've got to go do this yourself. And, and his sister kind of coached him along and, and he went and walked over and just asked to take a photo with his favorite player and the whole team got around him. And, and then he started talking and laughing and, and was over there for like 10 minutes. And, and I was just like, you know what, that's, that's, I'm so glad I did that because if I had just done it for him, he's not learning any lesson. Um, but it was really cool to see his sister co- coach him along as well. Um, so I'm, you know, they, they, again, it's like one of, one of those proud parent moments. Well, and, you know, it, it's got to be. My goodness, there she is kind of taking the lead going, hey, I, I got this and you're going to get it too, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you gotta love that. Well, and so, you know, and gosh, we've got the holidays just right around the corner. And for people that have bookworms in their family, you know, regardless where, where they are as far as age, I mean, mastering fear is the perfect holiday gift. And if uh, it's a little big for a stocking stuffer, but maybe you just need to get big stockings, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, hey, Brandon, where can people connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about all the great stuff you're doing? So I'm pretty active, as you know, on my Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. That's just at, at Brandon uh, T, as in Tyler Webb, with two Bs, uh, at Brandon T. Webb. And in my author site, which has all my books, it's brandontylerweb.com. Um, but I'm on Instagram. I, I really made a commitment last year to, to grow my account and, and engage with people. I don't have one unanswered DM on my Instagram. So if people want to just share the experience or they have questions, um, definitely, you know, find me on Instagram. Um, I'm happy to, happy to answer any questions. Well, and I know you're really busy because, gosh, you've got you know, a great marketing company that you run, that um, Hurricane Media, that's just absolutely fabulous, as well as, I mean, you do guest appearances on all the national networks. Do you also speak at different companies in regards to mastering fear at all? I mean, because I'm sure everyone's wanting you to come out and talk at their different organizations. Yeah, I do about half a dozen a year. Um, I've got a couple. I've got one maybe in Australia next year. Um, I, I don't do it as much as I would like only because, you know, being a dad and, and running, running a business, uh, and, and then, you know, writing on the side, it's just, there's so many, only so much time in the day. Um, but I do enjoy, uh, getting out there and, and kind of sharing my, my personal experience with, with companies and people, uh, whether it's around mastering fear uh, or leadership, you know, any, any of those kind of subjects. Well, you know your stuff when it comes to that. Obviously, you're the guy to go to to have it the next business organization. Any of these big corporations can easily have you come out and help their sales force kind of learn how to master fear so they can move forward as an organization together. You know, Brandon, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Yeah, of course, Marianne, anytime. It's always such an honor to spend time with you, Brandon. I'm so glad that we got to dive deeper into Mastering Fear. Such a great book, and it's a perfect gift for the holidays. Again, if you'd like to connect with Brandon, you can at his website, brandontylerweb.com. And you heard he was on Instagram and very active there, so make sure to connect with him there as well. Mastering Fear is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie bookstores. And if you don't see it on the shelf, it's because they ran out. Don't forget to ask for them to place your order for you. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count.
In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.